All right, in chapter 15, uh, we'll be looking at uh, cognitive development during adolescence. And uh, one thing that uh, they mention here is there's kind of a move from egocentrism to uh, abstract logical thinking that usually occurs between 11 and 18 years. And uh, that is usually due to uh, increase of brain maturation, which means uh, refers to uh, in in general, the uh, prefrontal cortex, the executive functions. And uh, they mention a couple other things like schooling, education, moral challenge, challenges, or moralistic type thinking. And uh, last but not least, you know, increased sense of independence. So those all actually uh, help contribute to uh, the contribute to the move from egocentrism to abstract logical thinking. Now, uh, during uh, adolescent thinking, they say, you know, that one tends to uh, still have what they call uh, engage in what's called adolescent egocentrism. And that's also known as imaginary audience that usually occurs between ages 10 to 13. And that basically is the uh, tendency to think uh, more about themselves and what other people think of them. Um, and they also kind of tend to regard themselves as being a little more unique, a little more special admired or disliked than they actually are. They mentioned a couple of fables here. Uh, these are just things that, uh, you know, uh, they call the personal fable for the first one. And that is um, adolescent egocentrism. And that is characterized by uh, that uh, the adolescent's thoughts, uh, feelings or experiences are unique to themselves more wonderful or awful than anyone else's. And so that's called the personal fable. And then the invincibility fable is that an adolescent's uh, uh, feelings, conviction that uh, he or she cannot be overcome or even harmed by anything that would defeat any other normal mortal, you know, such as things like uh, they give examples like unprotected sex, drug abuse, or high-speed driving. They just basically feel they're invincible. Now, in earlier stages, uh, we've talked a lot about Piaget, the important um, uh, theoretician. And uh, so Piaget, you know, he's his fourth and final stage of cognitive development uh, that occurs, you know, during this phase that we're discussing now, he calls formal operational thought. And that is, you know, more systematic logic and uh, the ability to start thinking more abstractly. And uh, so I, get, I, I included a few examples here for you to look at math, social studies, science, you know, how their thinking starts to change through adolescence. Now, hypothetical thought, uh, that just means that's reasoning that uh, one tends to use like propositions and possibilities uh, that may not reflect reality. And so that an example of that would be like, uh, you know, just considering like, well, if I do this, you know, that could, you know, that could possibly result in this type of uh, a type of thing or um, or something, you know, something like that. So another one, these these next two types of reasoning, um, I would definitely make note and pay special attention to uh, and take some time to think about each one uh, because these two types of reasoning are very important. Uh, the first one, deductive reasoning, that means reasoning from general statements or premises or principles and then logically progressing until you figure out uh, specifics. And that's called deduction. It means starting from the big picture and working your way logically to um, specifics. And, um, and in psychology, we call that top-down reasoning. And uh, so that means basically a reasoning that begins within the, the human mind the human brain and um, and then works its way into specifics that uh, deal with um, uh, things that are occurring in life or um, things like that. 
Now, inductive reasoning, on the other hand, is the opposite. That means beginning with the specific and then moving to general conclusions. And uh, so that's called bottom-up reasoning. That means beginning with general um, types of uh, ideas, principles, or things that occur within the environment, and then working the way until the human mind actually uh, comes to a conclusion. And so that is called inductive reasoning. Now there's a slide here, for something for you to think about if you like, and uh, I won't dwell on this. I'm going to move on, but feel free to pause the video if you want and think about this. Now two modes of thinking, intuition versus analysis. Now intuitive thought or intuition, you know, that is, uh, they say that it originates or arises from emotions or a general hunch, you know. Uh, it's kind of, they say, beyond rational explanation. And that is generally um, influenced by, uh, you know, past experiences and cultural assumptions. So definitely past experience and uh, cultural type um, assumptions are play an important part. They kind of act like uh, the foundation from which intuitive thought arises. And then on the other hand, analytic thought, you know, that is uh, uh, thought that results from analysis. So systematic uh, thinking about, you know, pros and cons, you know, or uh, risks and consequences, things of that nature. And, and they mentioned here, analytic thought, you know, that is really depends on logic and rationality. So you remember we call logic and rational thinking that uh, results from what we call executive functions, which um, pretty much are influenced and in, uh, controlled by our prefrontal cortexes. Now they talk about two modes of thinking here. And uh, so one is, uh, relying a little more on emotions and preferring emotional type uh, feelings and thoughts uh, or or thoughts that are actually um, influenced by feelings. And uh, so that is, uh, they call that rational judgment is difficult when egocentric emotions dominate, you know, so, uh, so that's something to keep in mind there, you know, that relying on, you know, just having emotional reactions and everything, um, can be a little more egocentrically dominated, you know, or uh, in origin. On the other hand, though, better thinking, you know, that's in intuitive decisions. Um, uh, they say they're not always the best, you know, but with maturity, you know, adolescence, they start, you know, using formal analytic thinking and uh, emotional experiential thinking. So learning from actually from experiences and then analyzing uh, the results of those experiences, and uh, hopefully that leads to better thinking. Okay, so they refer to dual processing in the brain. And uh, so basically what that means is a combination, you know, of uh, limbic system uh, and prefrontal cortex, you know, working together. And those develop gradually. They develop throughout uh, adolescence. Uh, I'm going to let you, uh, if you feel like pausing and looking at these, you know, feel free to do that. I am going to move on. Okay, so uh, think one thing that is affecting uh, uh, adolescent cognition these days is uh, technology. And so they're saying today's teenagers, you know, they call those digital natives. They take technology for granted because they grew up with those. And so they say many have been networking since childhood. You know, they've been using social media uh, uh, since they were children. And they thought, you know, they think that, hey, this has just always existed. And uh, this is how things go. This is how it how it works. Um, so I'm going to move on from here. Okay, so uh, we're still can, talking about technology and um, how it works, uh, how it's a, how it affects cognition, 
And they're saying, you know, learning through electronic technology. So before the technology um, explosion, they call that, you know, they mentioned here, you know, egocentric thought, it decreases with education, conversation, and experience. And that's something to, you know, that's really important to keep in mind, um, you know, because, um, and as I put this question in here, so does electronic technology and social networking, does that speed up or hamper the process of moving away from egocentric thought and more toward analytical, you know, um, reasoning? So it's just something to consider. Now, just one thing that's important here, I'm not too concerned here about the actual graphs or anything. Uh, definitely look at those if you're, uh, you know, have a moment. But what I underlined here is technology, you know, that what they found, you know, is that encourages uh, kind of rapid shifts of attention, Def definitely rapid attention, tensional uh, shifting and multitasking without reflection, you know, analytical reflection. And it also kind of tends to um, encourage visual learning instead of uh, analysis. So that is something to consider as well. So is technology an addiction? You know, so research findings, you know, and they say, you know, look, uh, you know, average people, you know, uh, average adolescents these days, you know, they play video games, you know, two or more hours a day, you know, on average, you know, remember, these are generalizations, these don't apply to every single adolescent. And so I put in here, you know, just under red. So what do you think, you know, is it is do you think that's an addiction or not, you know, and I put a note here that uh, psychiatrists, you know, that uh, when they were writing the new DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, so after consideration, they did not include it as an addiction. So what do you think about that? All right, moving on. Now, definitely, you know, uh, with the increased, uh, you know, um, interaction with technology and everything these days, you know, things like cyberbullying, you know, really can affect um, adolescents. And uh, so I will uh, let you take a look at this and uh, will not um, go into this too much deeper. This is just for you to look at on your own. And they say that, you know, definitely some things, you know, that, uh, you know, you know, we'll talk about some pros and cons, you know, of technology and everything for adolescents, you know, and they say some of the cons here um, is uh, the, uh, you know, the adolescent imaginary audience can go viral. And they're saying, you know, like, so for texting, you know, so, you know, those kinds of things, uh, you know, that text can be spread and, um, you know, and uh, can cause, you know, like cyber bullying, you know, and cause uh, depression and may, you know, even influence some adolescents to consider suicide or commit suicide. And uh, remember, these are, you know, just some uh, certain cases. These are not um, meant to be applicable to all adolescents. And then they talk about, you know, some other things that can occur here, you know, uh, sexting. And uh, so I will definitely let you, if you're interested in uh, checking out the, you know, the specifics on this, you know, pause the video and, and look at this here. All right, I'm moving on. Okay, so just really quickly, you know, you're saying, you know, so what, uh, you know, you know, considering cognitive change, you know, cognitive development, you know, between, um, you know, moving from middle childhood into adolescence, you know, and they're saying, you know, like the different types of education, you know, they, they mention here secondary education, and that occurs, you know, uh, uh, between ages 12 to 18. And, um, and it, of course, that is, uh, in, that's a generalization that can be different, you know, um, according to different cultures and different schools and things like that. And then, of course, middle school, uh, that's usually grades five, six, you know, and ends with uh, grade eight, generally speaking. And then I put a note down here, you know, that, um, you know, political leaders, they recognize that educated adults, they advance national wealth and health. 
And that's something to consider, you know, about edu the importance of education. Okay, moving on. All right, there's, uh, you know, just talking a little bit about middle school. And uh, so this is uh, for you to look at on your own. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. Now, during during uh, middle school ages, though, you know, they say that, you know, uh, you know, that's an important time when students, you know, they're seeking, you know, like peer acceptance, you know, so they're looking to fit in and uh, be accepted by their um, their friends or their clique or their group of friends that they, you know, uh, uh, hang out with, you know, so uh, coping with middle school, you know, they tend to um, um you know, blame others, you know, and, and it's a more incremental approach to intelligence um, during the age group right there, during that uh, developmental phase. So that's just to be compared with um, uh, other phases, you know, in, in future studies here. All right, so the entity approach to intelligence. So we're starting to talk about intelligence here. And um, you remember we've discussed that in, in previous uh, uh, classes and chapters, you know, that intelligence, you know, that that in and of itself, it's kind of hard to come to a specific definition. But um, one thing that's interesting is uh, the two different ways that intelligence is thought, thought about. Uh, the one, they call it the entity approach. And that's when one um, actually sees intelligence as being innate. You know, so basically, you know, people will feel, certain people will feel that, hey, you know, you're born with your intelligence. You're born with a certain amount. You inherited it, you know, genetically. You inherited it from your parents and everything, and you are um, fixed at that level of intelligence through the rest of your life. And uh, so it says, you know, that that rejects the idea that effort enhances achievement. So that's just something to consider and uh, consider whether you agree with that or not. Now, on the other hand, though, there are those who feel that um, intelligence can actually be developed incrementally through effort. So constant effort and one becomes intelligent, more intelligent gradually that um, intelligence is built upon previously gained intelligence. So that um, is something to consider. And uh, that is, an, I would say, you know, um, that would be an important uh, kind of foundational type of attitude that uh, education, going to school and everything, uh, school work is actually built upon. Now, uh, an important thing to consider here, you know, definitely is uh, that that affects uh, you know, learning and regardless of the age level and everything, but um, transitioning to, into new schools and everything that can actually um, really, uh, really affect a student's um, academic performance and everything. So they say, you know, uh, you know, changing schools just when growth spurt is occurring and sexual characteristics are developing is bound to create stress for the student. And that stress, as we've uh, discussed, you know, in former chapters and everything, but that causes a lot of neurophysiological um, effects that um, can hamper a student's um, academic performance. All right, moving on. So in high school here, you know, there's uh, a couple things, you know, they're really important in, in develop, getting a lot, a lot more uh, momentum these days. And number one, you know, a lot of people consider, you know, high school and a lot of students themselves consider their high school to be college prep, you know, college bound. They're preparing for college. And um, so they say, you know, at that age, you know, that they, they, they mention, you know, teachers assume that students have mastered formal thinking and they're not too concerned with teaching them how to think formally. So that's something important to keep in mind. And um, 
So, and then the others are using exams and we, we know about a lot of exams, you know, they call them high stakes tests, you know, and that can be SAT, PSATs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's, um, and it says uh, that those high stakes tests, you know, uh, those are meant to evaluate um, whether students will uh, succeed or fail in college or in, you know, for into, you know, adult type uh, transitioning. And so I put, you know, I let, I sit down here, you know, I put, do these tests really work? What do you think about those? So, you know, in the United States, um, one result of pushing almost all high school students to pursue an academic curriculum is that more are prepared for college. But another result, what they found, though, is more students drop out of high school because of that. And so why do you think that is? Why do you think that um, that it would be there would be those two diametrically opposed dynamics occurring? Something to think about. OK, and uh, we're just discussing, well, what about those who do not end up going to college and everything? So so. Uh, this is just something for you to look at here, and uh, I did put some notes down below here when I said why, you know, so, so it's just something to consider on your own, okay? And finally, choosing vocations. So basically, you know, at that, at that age, you know, especially late high school and everything, you know, students will hear this, you know, adolescents will hear this question quite often. And that is, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, and so they are actually, in a way, sort of pressured to start thinking about that and, um, you know, considering what they're going to do when they become adults, you know. And that can be a stressful thing, you know, and, and kind of confusing thing, too, um, without proper guidance and, uh, and help with that. Okay, and so uh, this ends our uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I would just like to um, uh, say that if you want to, you know, review this, you know, take your time, pause it on certain slides, and, um, you know, if you get a little more in-depth consideration and insight into this. Thank you.